May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be only acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. We pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Last Sunday we learned a little bit about the meaning of being baptized into Christ's death. And today we will learn more about what effect that baptism is to have upon us. You see, it is through our baptism that God has consecrated us to lead a life that is to be marked, be marked by a self-consecration as shown to the world by our words and our deeds to the service of God. Now Paul in his epistle for today gives an imperfect illustration in his attempt to show us how we must dedicate our lives to God. And it is an image that most of us here today will find very uncomfortable, in fact do find uncomfortable. And that is the image that we are slaves, not to a human master, but to Christ as our master. And we find this image uncomfortable because we consider ourselves to be free in so many different ways. Yet we are not really free. And Paul reminds us of this when he says in Romans 6.16, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness? Paul reminds us here that if, we are, that if we sin, perhaps when we sin, we are the slaves of sin because we are in bondage to it no matter how free we think we are. If you doubt what I am saying, consider anyone, which we probably all know, at least one person addicted to drugs. They will do anything to support their habits. They are more slaves in bondage to that habit than anyone who is merely physically bound in slavery. You see, if you take a physical slave and move him to another place which doesn't have slavery, they're free. But a drug addict isn't. He brings his slavery with them wherever they go. They are in slavery to that. And it doesn't matter what the sin is. I could pick any number of them. In fact, we just rehearsed ten of them. But anyway, that's beside the point. That is the problem with our slavery. Is that it is ourselves that do it. When we submit ourselves to sin. Now Paul apologizes for using this image. Because he cannot think of anything, in his opinion and mine, that in any way, shape, or form is serving Christ's slavery. And he proceeds to explain to us some of these facets, if you will, of our self-consecration to Christ. Now the first point that Paul makes is that we are to be conscientious in serving Christ, even as we were in serving sin. Is this a point that you think really has to be made? Paul thought so. I do too. For example, how many of us will go to the uttermost limits to squeeze every bit of, quote, fun, unquote, into our vacations and come home exhausted from them needing another vacation. We are dedicated to having fun on our vacation. And we'll do anything. We don't stay up late at night, get up early, spend money, it doesn't matter. But at the same time, you can't come to church on a holy day because you've already been to church once this week. What do you want me to go every day? Oops, anyway. Paul tells us that we need to be just as dedicated to serving Jesus Christ as we are to serving our own passions. Now the second point that Paul makes is the fact that there is no middle ground here. There is no third choice. We will either serve sin or we will serve righteousness. 
Period. End of sentence. This dichotomy, and it is a true dichotomy, goes all the way back to Moses speaking to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19. He says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Thou and thy seed. I don't know if you've ever heard this word before. Maybe some of you have. But have you ever heard of generational sin? Yes. Where the sin of the parents is visited to the children to the third and fourth generations. Why? Because the children know no different. Moses says that thou and thy children may live. Do we really want to condemn our children to a life like that? Anyway. Well, since we only have two possibilities to choose from, Paul goes on to describe the payment, if you will, of choosing one or the other, of choosing Christ or sin. And you just heard me read in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin is death. Now, I really wonder, I truly wonder, if we understand both the long term and the immediate results of sin that he is talking about. Now, intellectually we know, and theologically we believe, <coughs> that on Judgment Day, those who have not claimed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be eternally separated from God and cast into eternal darkness. All right. We, we got the ultimate part. Now, while that is certainly the ultimate result of sin, do we realize the immediate effects of sin that is taking place within us? Do we think that we can just sin a little bit? And then, oh, well, I got plenty of time. I'll go, you know, I'll repent later. We got plenty of time before the final judgment. <laughs> Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, the Reverend Melville Scott, in his commentary on the epistle for today, puts it this way, and I think you will understand better. The wages are the immediate result, just as the end is the final consequence of sin. The immediate consequences of sin are death. For each sin diminishes our capacity for life intellectual, moral, and spiritual. Sin darkens the intellect, blunts the conscience, and deadens all the faculties of the soul. These consequences are wages. For every sin has its just recompense and reward paid down surely and punctually when we sin. As wages are paid for each day's labor, so also are each day's sin. We have not to wait until the final reckoning, for we receive our reward by installments through the final, though the final reckoning and end of sin is death. Daily dying, daily being consecrated to sin is death. It's not postponed. We don't have the time. Just as the wages of sin are sure, so are the wages of Christ. But there's two vast differences between the wages that we receive. The first is, is that since the actions, all actions, proceed out of the heart and soul of a person, the fruit that they bear is entirely different. And it's a fruit that sin can never have. This fruit is, of course, well-pleasing to God and to others. The only fruit that sin brings forth is a disease that ultimately consumes the person doing it. The other point is that the gift of eternal life is a free gift. And even while a person deserves death, 
Life is freely given in Jesus Christ. It is not something that we begin to deserve when we choose goodness or righteousness or right acting. It is something that God has given to us in spite of our sins. And again, as Reverend Scott points out, yet we may learn that righteousness like sin has both a present reward, the yoke ever easier, the burden lighter, the peace deeper, and the hope ever more assured, and also a final end to which it is ever tending, even eternal life. It is the, if you will, the trajectory of our lives that determines our ultimate destination. If we are eternally seeking to please God, then we are constantly approaching Him. If we are constantly approaching that idea where we are only pleasing ourselves, we are getting farther away from Him, and our trajectory is away from Him rather than toward Him. Now, sometimes we may say, well, I'll, well, God doesn't know what I need. I'm afraid you're wrong. And that brings us to the gospel lesson for today. The feeding of the 4,000 as well as the feeding of the 5,000 is, is recorded six different times, three for each. We have to make sure that we get the point of this. And that's, I guess, why it's recorded so many times. Jesus goes into the wilderness and he calls his followers to follow him, which they do, and we do. And of course, in our own strength and in our own faculties and everything, we use up everything we have. And we are, as it says in scripture, and hungered, just as Jesus was in the temptation. We show our devotion, and Christ gives us the grace that we may, and he responds to our needs because he does know what we need. And we'll see to those needs that they are met. Just as he feeds the multitudes. But the point is. Is the bounty of Christ. He takes very, very, very little. And turns it into a whole lot. So much that in the example for today, seven baskets of meat. Not of bread this time. Meat. Out of those little fishes, seven baskets, he multiplied. He does that for all of the things that we do. He takes a little and makes much. He will not leave his people empty-handed. He will give them the gifts of his spirit so that they may do what needs to be done. Follow him. This is the master whom we serve. Not only a God of power and light, he is also the God of love and consolation, of caring. He is the author of all good things through his love for us. So as we consider our service to our master, and I beg us to choose wisely which master we are going to serve, that in the service of God, we seek an increase of that service, a nourishment of that service, and a perseverance in that service, so that when our time to stand before the Lord is done, that we may in surety of heart and mind and soul know that we are His, and He will know it too. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost.